up the old maid's straw where the grass is green. Wolves a little mean, and the arrow leaves tall. Where the meadow larks sing, through the cows bellowing, and the rhubarb grows. Out of rocks, I've gathered all day, pushing pears up the straw through the hawthorn trees. I send a yip and a howl. I've gathered all day, pushing pears up the straw. To the hawthorn trees, I send a yip and a howl up the old maid's straw, where the grass is green. Wolves a little mean. Where the meadow larks sing, through the cows bellowing, and the rhubarb grows out of rocks. I've gathered all day, pushing pears up the straw. The cows made sure I seen views from both knobs. I've gathered all day, pushing pears up the straw. The cows made sure. I seen views from both knobs. Hey y'all, Kelly here. Welcome to the Ground Shots podcast, a podcast that explores our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling. Hello from Western Colorado. I am a little sick right now. I've tried to record this intro a few times, and so I'm going to try my best right now to record it for y'all and get this episode out because I'm really excited to share it with you. Thought I would be able to not get sick, but everybody around me has been, and so I managed to, and um, I'm on the mend now, but I'm still uh, coughing a bit and and having trouble sometimes speaking without like having to take a cough break moment. So here we are, and I'm going to try to get through um, this little intro here and keep it short and sweet so we can get to the conversation. I'm really excited about this conversation. I recorded it um, not too long ago in the back of the new Paonia Books bookstore right in downtown Paonia, Colorado, and that bookstore just opened this fall. I guess it was like late fall, and I met this author, Susan Tweet, at the opening for the bookstore, and it was like a little evening grand opening night where they had like someone serving cider, and they had, um, some snacks and things and just people showed up into the evening to check out the new space and I overheard Susan talking about plants with someone and then we got into a really awesome conversation and then realized she's a botanist and ecologist and has a lot of interesting things to say about plants and so we were like let's maybe try to do a podcast interview sometime it just worked out for Susan and I to do it pretty soon after we had that conversation and we actually met in this really awesome back room of the bookstore that's a space they use for or they're going to use for writing workshops. So we met up back there and had a conversation 
and it was really great. And, um, so I'm really just excited to share two people who love to write sitting together and who also love plants and who also love to talk about the politics of plants. And I just felt this immediate knowing that we would be able to have like some really interesting things to talk about in, in a, in a recorded conversation with y'all. So this conversation is pretty informal in the sense that like, I didn't even get to really like jump into an introduction with Susan before we just started talking. And then it just flowed and went from there. I love when that happens. Susan is a plant biologist with a calling to restore nature and our connection with the community of the land, especially close to home. And home for her is the West, the vast landscapes of the West, especially the deserts. And uh, she's lived in a couple different places across the West, but um, definitely has some super particular places she calls home, which she talks about in this conversation with me. Plants are her people, as she says, fascinated by the myriad ways they weave the world's living communities, forming the green tapestry that covers this planet. Susan began her career as a field ecologist studying sagebrush, grizzly bears, and wildfires. She reveled in the work and the time outside in the west expansive landscapes, but eventually realized she loved the stories and the data more than the collecting of that data, which I could totally resonate with which became a big theme of our conversation that you're about to hear. She has written a handful of books on a wide variety of themes, but often focuses on human and place relationships. Some of her titles include Barren, Wild and Worthless, Living in the Chihuahuan Desert, The Rocky Mountain Garden Guide, and Bless the Birds, Living with Love in the Time of Dying. I'm really excited to share this conversation with Susan with you. I really hope you enjoy it. A couple things. In the very beginning, we both still had our cell phones on. And it's crazy how much this affects audio sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. You can hear a little audio inf- interference in the first tiny chunk of the interview. And then we both realized our phones were on because we got messages. <laughs> we turned them off and then that ended. So I didn't really edit it all out but it isn't too bad. And then you don't hear it anymore after a certain point. So just to forewarn you, that's probably from our cell phones. You can support this project on Patreon at patreon.com slash salt. You can also support the podcast by doing donations through PayPal and Venmo. The links for ways to do that are in the show notes for this episode and every episode and on the website all over it. Well, let's go ahead and get to this conversation, and uh, I really hope you enjoy this talk with Susan. It, you know, goes from an ecology study to a writing workshop to really deeply personal, like, conversation about memoir and, like, processing emotion and thinking about science in the world we live in, and there's so many realms we touch, so I really hope you yeah, you appreciate the way we weave it all together. So happy listening, y'all. That, Sometimes you know. I do drawing practice to get people to pay attention to what they're seeing and hearing and all that. And so what we'll do is, you know, the blind thing where you close your eyes and you you have an image in your that you know you just looked at something like a piece of lichen and and you try to in one line capture the outline of it, which is fascinating. I also make people shut their eyes for two minutes and I time it and write whatever they hear, smell all that stuff and they're like but we won't be able to read our writing and I'm like no you'll be able to read your writing it's just going to be weird you know yeah but um when you shut your eyes because we're such a predominantly visual species Mm -hmm. the moment you shut your eyes suddenly there's noises you you were that weren't getting through in the channel you know Mm -hmm. there's smells there's you can feel the any air movement on your Mm -hmm. face or your exposed skin I mean it's like a whole other world as soon as Mm -hmm. you close your eyes and shut off that dominant nerve channel which is Mm -hmm. your vision Mm -hmm. so much of our sensing information we take in like 60 or 70 percent is vision yeah and that's so little of the world so I'm always fascinated by that. So I like to do that to people because if they haven't ever done it before, they're like, what? I didn't even, you know, I, I could taste the air. I'm like, yes, because you weren't, it wasn't your eyes commanding all of your attention. It'd be interesting to try to do some plant ID without looking. <laughs> I do that occasionally, but I have to be really careful about where I do it, you know? 
I've done a lot of my teaching in the Southwest, and so you have to be super careful about oh, that. Cactus is yeah. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> to quote Ed Abbey, misquote Ed Abbey, you know, everything out there is spiny or thorny or wants to bite you or poison you, so yeah. you have to be super careful. <laughs> but part of that is if, if you're a plant person living in the Southwest, you have to create your own shade to keep from losing water. And, the, and actually spines and thorns and that kind of thing are more about shade, mm. the compromise between shade and getting enough sun to, to feed yourself. So spines and thorns are a tremendously efficient way of producing shade mm. because they cast overlapping patterns as the sun moves during the day, and they also break the constant air movement, which means there's less evap evapotranspiration mm. from the surface of the plant. I, didn't, so, I thought it was more about predator. No, they're really more about, oh. about shade. And you, can, you realize that when you start to look at how some of the, um, some of the grazers like pack rats um, in the higher desert are tremendous consumers of cacti and they eat around those aerials with like it's not all the little spines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you'll see like when I used to walk my partner's dog um, on the trail by where we lived outside Santa Fe, I would see uh, before Badger, the dog saw them fortunately because he'd get them in his feet if he didn't, I would see where the pack rats had left piles of spines on the trail, right in the middle of the trail, um, from eating choya and um, prickly pear cacti. And they literally, they get all of the flesh and all you get are these skeletal um, radiating whorl with the central spine sticking mm -hmm. out of the cacti. It's like somebody somehow vanished all the flesh. And they manage to do it. They know how to meticulously do it without getting poked. They absolutely <laughs> do. And you watch them and they're like, they're like sculptors de-sculpting mm -hmm. the choya stem or the cactus. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty fun. Anyway. Um, crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I might go down there this winter at some point. I, I haven't many times in the past gone down to the Sonoran and then over to the Gila. We'll see this winter. We'll it's, um, it's a great area to hang out in. There's a new proposal. The Center for Biodiversity has just proposed to um, Fish and Wildlife Service that they reintroduce jaguars in the Gila. Whoa. Because jaguars, there's only one that we know of north of the border, um, a lone male, and jaguars actually originally are from North America, and they moved southward over time. They radiated southward over mm. time, and they've been on the endangered list and threatened and endangered list for 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. And they've never been um, the sexiest one to reintroduce. And so Center for Biodiversity has decided it's time to press Fish and Wildlife, Federal Fish and Wildlife Service to do something about that. And they've proposed the Gila as a place to do it, which would be fairly cool in a lot of ways. The Gila. It's just when you talk about less altered by modern sentiments, the Gila definitely has the least, probably. Sure, there's feral cows from the Spanish days, but those are well, kind of cool. There's feral cows. <laughs> there's actually feral cows from more recent days. There have been some pretty high-profile mm. um, disputes between ranchers and the federal and the Forest Service and also um, BLM and Fish and Wildlife about cows in the wilderness there. I've even seen in some places where people have their cows, their personal cows like in the wilderness areas past where they're supposed to for yeah. sure there and then there's those roaming herds that are further out that are yeah. older and yeah. feralized or whatever that aren't anybody's i guess yeah. but yeah i mean and i mean i guess that's a place where they reintroduce wolves mm -hmm. to Mexican gray wolves. yeah which mm -hmm. i've not heard out there that was one of the things we focused on with our southwest signal fire trip was the wolf, re like we went to all pl these places that the wolves were either introduced or going to be, yeah, potentially, nice. and just themed everything around that. Of course, there's all these tangents you can go on, and yeah. That, but that was why we went to Gila for that trip. It was like, nice. That is such a beautiful one. country. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. No, not there. But we went into the Blue Range primitive area oh. and stayed in some of these little remote kind of shacks out there or yeah. well we camped outside of them but that's where the water was um where people there was like a log book in the shack people horse pack out and they'll like stay yeah. around there or whatever in the log books have people noting that they heard them there yeah. for sure but we know none of us did but you know i got to see some of them before they reintroduced them when they had them at one of ted turner's ranches on the east side of the gila above truth or consequences Anyway, they had a big acclimation pen there. 
before they reintroduced any. This is, you know, 30 years ago. And it was just super cool to see them because I know the northern gray wolves from the Yellowstone reintroduction. And Mexican gray wolves are so much smaller, they're like Mm -hmm. about half the size, that it was fascinating to see them behaving like wolves, but just being smaller. Looking almost like fox slash coyote creatures or something, but different. Yeah, they they look like wolves. Foxes are more delicate, you know, more cat-like in a lot of ways, especially desert foxes, the various species of desert foxes. They're just less robust in the, you know, northern wolves can be pretty herky. Um, Mexican gray wolves are more slender but very leggy, unlike coyotes. They look like coyotes with longer legs and mm-hmm. little broader shoulders, broader head, more wedge head. Um, but they were cool. That was fun to see them. Then I'm, I'm from like southern Virginia, North Carolina border, and they reintroduced wolves to over on the coast of North Carolina in the alligator wildlife refuge. Yeah, red wolves. Yeah. yeah. And that's like such a big intense swamp it's like where it, there's no way that anybody i mean they're really protected there yeah yeah but it's like a whole other conversation and you know yeah it's like what <laughs> the, the wolf thing i mean yeah. and who's to, who's like worthy of protection and why and even the whole wolf and coyote conversation is huge but like there there's a lot of trouble there and then down in the New Orleans area, I think there's another place that they reintroduced. Them. Oh, northern Louisiana in the in the in the swamps, the bald cypress swamps. Um, yeah, that's the, the Fisher Tract and all that area where they, the last place anybody ever saw, a um, ivory-billed woodpecker. Oh. Um, way back in the 1950s. There's the oh. but then they're having trouble with the fact that those red wolves are bre- interbreeding with coyotes in some yeah. places, and they're like, wait. We can't protect them anymore. Like, we don't have funding yeah. to protect yeah. the coyotes, but how do we keep them from... You can't really keep... They, they want to hang out sometimes, and sometimes they don't, but, like, it's well, a controversy there around, like, how to manage wild animals because they're they yes. got to be themselves, too, right? And that gets back to something we were talking about when we, were, when we met out in the bookstore, mm-hmm. and that is this whole idea of who gets to decide. You know, what's a weed... What's a species that belongs? Um, And to me, that's a super fascinating conversation because it reveals our human perspectives and biases. There is no hard answer, honestly. I don't like the word weed, actually. I would love to have it struck from the language because it is always pejorative, whether you use the gardener's definition, which is a plant that I don't want, it's out of place, as it were, place in quotes, you know, and, and that's the person saying it, deciding what that plant's place is. Um, or whether it's the definition, the ecological definition that I tend to use, which is that a weed is a, is a playground bully, um, a plant that doesn't play well with others and is disruptive in an ecosystem. That's still human values. You know, that's anybody's perspective, anybody's belief system, anybody's values, making a value judgment about another species. To me, um, weed is just one of those words that doesn't serve us well. It's cultural and it's not absolutely cultural objective. And we use it with <laughs> humans too. I wrote a whole essay about that in in one of my books, Barren, Wild, and Worthless: um, Living in the Chihuahuan Desert. It's called Weeds, and it's about who we let cross the border, who we consider okay, and what plants we dislike and want to eradicate. And it's it's all about that question of who belongs and who gets to decide who belongs. Yeah, there's a lot of layers to that conversation, and that's one I've had on the podcast in different directions. It's super. It's a super. I mean, it's funny. I was like gonna. T- we're like basically in the interview now. Hi, everybody. But like, I was gonna ask you to talk about that a little bit at the end. But here, we're just doing it. But I think with this particular conversation, it's so tricky because like, I don't think the science around introduced plants and invasive plants is inherently without emotional language and emotional cultural like pieces to it all because on the one hand there are certain things that can feel pretty objective about it all and there's other things that are just like it is about what you're saying like who are you asking what a weed is it really depends on what someone's goals are intentions are what they consider a balanced ecosystem to look like what you know um and yeah. less obviously on the surface what their belief system is and where they're coming to it from. Yeah. But that's science. You know, we have this fiction that science is objective. 
And that's not true, it's being done by humans. It is a system of, a, of, of attaining and partly ground truthing knowledge. But it's not a system without prejudice yeah. because it's being practiced by humans. So all science is, is the idea that you're interested in understanding something and so you pose a question about it and then you go out and test that question as objectively as possible and when you get results and discern some kind of pattern in them, you go back and see if you can replicate those results. Or if they don't hold up at all, you go, okay, that was an artifact of the moment or the research design or whatever. Let's approach that question from another way. So science isn't like something infallible. Yeah. It's simply a system of gathering information in a way that is perhaps less likely to be made unobjective, but it's practiced by humans. So of course it's not gonna be entirely objective. And that's a fiction that scientists like to maintain, especially now when science is so under fire, but it's not, it doesn't serve any of us well. Science is simply a way of obtaining knowledge and trying to ground truth it that can usually be replicated so you have some sense that what you're the patterns you're discerning give you some useful information. Yeah. Weeds, because they're a cultural, even when we say invasive plants, it's a cultural interpretation, are really difficult to parse out that way. I think that when I think about invasive species, um, and I've spent a lot of time restoring ecosystems, I have to start thinking about what's the point in restoring an ecosystem? What are we aiming for? It depends on the place, the time, the objectives of the particular cultural interest in doing it. So like when I was talking to friends, um, I, I spent last summer working on a guest ranch in Wyoming in the Wind River Mountains, and I was talking to some friends who are um, um, Shoshone from the um, Shoshone Arapaho Reservation, the Wind River Reservation there, and they're re reintroducing bison because bison are hugely important to their culture. And in the doing, they're having to resolve some issues with Shoshone Arapaho cattlemen, and especially Arapaho farmers, um, and that means how do we deal with the bison? How do we give them some kind of migratory pattern? Because <clears throat> bison, you know, didn't evolve in enclosures, um, and they tend to be fairly cavalier about fences. They'll go right through them um, unless you make them really sturdy, and they have and they have a. Uh, in their cells, they have a need to move up into the mountains in summer and move down into the basin in winter to escape the deeper snows. So how you set up, even on a reservation as big as the Wind River Reservation, how you set up a migration corridor for them, how you deal with the people who are now running cattle in the area of that migration corridor um, and maybe farming in some of the creek bottoms, and then how you decide how you're gonna deal with the weed seeds, and I'm using that, that word, mm -hmm. the invasive plant seeds like hound's tongue or um, some of the other seeds that love to get stuck in curly bison fur, how do you deal with the fact that they're gonna take those up onto the wilderness, which the Wind River Reservation manages part of the Wind Rivers, um, the Shoshone Arapaho councils together manage part of the high country up there. How are you gonna deal with the fact that the bison will carry seeds of plants we don't necessarily want in those less disturbed ecosystems up in the mountains and roll around and wallow as bison do and plant those invasive plants there. How are you going to deal with that? What are you going to do? Who do you decide gets to stay and who doesn't? And that's a question they're really wrestling with. And as my friends said to me, well, we don't have a federal, we don't have the legal structure that say the Forest Service, who I used to work for, has in that case. We don't have to do a national environmental policy review of this, but we are accountable to the land and to our people. And so what we do instead is talk with the elders. What we do is a different process and it'll take us longer. And that may mean for a while we go backwards in terms of inv invaders and then we have to deal with that, but we will. It's just that the way we do it is a different process. And that really brought home to me the idea that we may all together have the same view about some species, um, my Shoshone friends and I, but the way we see them is very different. 
Um, and the way we're going to treat them is very different. So for instance, we were talking about, because this was at an um, Invasive Species Council meeting, we were talking about how you would treat hound's tongue or knapweed or some of the other invasive species from Eurasia that have become a real problem in wild areas because they crowd out the plant species that have relationships with all the others in that community. Some of them encourage fire in places where fire hasn't evolved and those plants haven't evolved with fire. So they're plants that we want to, at the very least, be careful about allowing to take over large areas of landscape in order to keep the health of what we see right now as we define it. But they're saying, yes, but we're not going to go in there with pesticides because we don't see that as appropriate. And I'm saying, yeah, absolutely, I don't do that in my work in Yellowstone or anywhere else if I can help it. There are occasional small areas where I might recommend them, but that's like last resort. So it's fascinating to me to realize between cultures how much we may agree on the species we don't prefer to have around, but the way we deal with them is very different. And we have a lot to learn from each other, I think. But that comes back, that circles right back around to where we started, which is the whole idea that this is a cultural construct. You know, mm -hmm. what's, what's invasive and what restoration means are cultural constructs. One thing is the bison themselves, they don't work within fence lines and boxes and private land ownership, right? This is something I come yes. up against a lot. I went to the talk at the library the other day with the earth regenerators folks. I missed most of it because I got the time mixed up, but I'm, I did catch someone's talk at the end about beavers and mm -hmm. restoring with beavers. And you're like, well, same kind of dilemma. Beavers don't see private land lines. They don't see the boxes and the squares. We need them on in, on the landscape for an, uh, many, many reasons, <laughs> but they frustrate people because of the framework we live in, right? Yep. Like we, we ha our land has to be economic enough to be able to pay the taxes. So then if it's flooded out by a beaver, what do you do? And the same with the bison, they challenge people's, the frameworks we live in now, like when they were able to roam free, we didn't have private land ownership in that way. There might have been areas where groups of indigenous peoples tended to be like, this is our zone. And some of those zones overlapped with other yeah. groups and stuff. But like the bison moved with the ecology, like the flow of ecologies, you know, like don't, the heads which don't have lines, you yes. know, like sagebrush stuff yeah. doesn't end right here on this line and then Penny yes. and Juniper starts here. Yeah. So there's that, like, how do you restore, like, like this goes for, like, animal, like, putting animals back, which we're talking about a little bit now, too, but also, like, thinking about restoring plant, like, ecologies, you know, plants, plants, groups, you know, into some sentiment of what we imagine it was, right? There's, like, this... How do we do that when we can't control whether they carry the weed seeds, right. you know, or we can't control now what birds are going to carry what around. And exactly. Like, yeah. And we might be able to restore up to this fence, but the person on the other side might not do the same thing. And that we, that continuity is needed to actually do something. And that was what we came to in that talk the other day too, is like, well, these people might be on board, but what about the people up there and down there? If they just say no, then how do you actually restore the watershed? Yeah. And so those are all questions in there. And then there's also like the piece of like, how do we really know in the big picture, like 500 years from now that the knapweed might actually be building? You know, this is something I think about with certain plants. Say, for example, I'm from the South. We've got kudzu. We've got definitely these plants that are intense there in that landscape. But, you know, you look under kudzu and there's, like, so many feet of new topsoil that's made. There's, like, benefits at times, too. And sometimes we're like, you know, and there's a culture forming around the kudzu. Well, it's here. We might as well all weave with it. We might as well put the goats on it. We might as well, you know, make rope out of it. But, like, it's, no, it's like no matter what we do, we can't get rid of it. And it's also benefiting the land in some ways. Sure, it's doing things that we feel like is negative as well but like how do we embrace the reality too that we're probably not going to be able to pull up every nap weed right and what will it look like in 500 years perhaps they'll go away on their own and they're building the soil back up but as long as we're still doing the things that cause the problem in the first place which perhaps is like oh disturbing the land in a way that's not great so yeah. the nap weed's like okay i'm coming in here because you did that yeah you made you know. space for me, so I'm moving in. I think one thing that invasive species tell us is that we need to change the way we're behaving. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that's a really difficult thing. And that go, going back to what you said about the beavers, um, beavers flood a piece of land and then what do you do economically? You can't use it the way you thought you could. Well, I think that challenges our whole pattern of A, land ownership. I think of myself as um, not an owner of the yard and house I happen to live in, but um, more having been adopted by them. Mm -hmm. And my question is what do they need from me to be well, to be healthy? And that sort of turns the whole land ownership thing on its head. And I think we need to do that with a lot of our systems. And this is one of those like big future, you know, big comes anarchists. Things. Like, let's um, get rid of private land. But, well, I don't, I'm not yeah. sure I'm, I'm out there, but where <laughs> I am is let's change our relationship with it. Let's see ourselves differently, not as owners, but as um, partners or um, adoptees of the land. And that implies that we have to change sort of our tax structure. Um, and this is something I've thought for a long time. Um, my, my dear friend here who has a farm uphill gets agricultural tax exemptions on his 20 acres and pays a very low, he pay, probably pays less property taxes than I do for my house and my yard here in town. Mm -hmm. um, because he produces a certain value of agricultural products off of his land every year. He grows hay for horses. Um, he also boards horses and trains them. And that's, you know, I'm not going to argue the value or not value of that. But what if I wanted to have 20 acres and nurture the soil microbes and the pollinators? Can't I get a tax break for that because I'm making my land healthier? So there's a place where I see that our structures need to change. We need to challenge the historic Western, yeah. or as my native friends would say, settler view of um, land ownership and what's an appropriate way to have a relationship with the land, including the word use um, and the word resource. Land yeah, is not a resource. They're land loaded is words. A, <laughs> yes, land is a community of its own and we get a lot of benefits off this land, starting first and foremost with the plants that clothe our land, breathe out the oxygen we require for our lives. We breathe that in and our waste gas, carbon dioxide, they breathe in. So we're in this, re this really tight reciprocal relationship with plants. If we had no plants and especially not sort of healthy communities working together, making the soil healthy, all that, we wouldn't be able to survive here in this world. Do we think about that when, whenever we take a breath? Uh-uh, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, do we think about when we think about kudzu, and this is a question I don't know the answer of, but I wonder when we talk about kudzu building soil, which I have no doubt it does, has anybody sampled the micro populations under that kudzu? One of the things we're learning about invasive species is they tend to um, have much lower biodiversity in the soil beneath them because they have no relationship or few relationships with the thousands of bacteria, um, springtails, <clears throat> earthworms if you live somewhere where, like the south where it's wet enough for earthworms, all of the critters that live in the soil and keep it healthy um, that clean the water flowing through it back to the groundwater, all that kind of thing. If you sample under invasive species like large stands of knapweed or cheatgrass um, out here in the west, because that's where my knowledge is, the micro, the, the soil biodiversity is very, very low. And we don't know if that's because the invasive species are doing something that impairs that biodiversity or simply because they don't have relationships with those microbes, which are in many cases, um, obtaining nutrients from the plants via root hairs and that kind of thing. I mean, there's this, there's this whole interweaving of lives below the surface of the soil that we're just starting to learn about, really, in the last decade mm -hmm. or two. And there's a whole lot we don't know. What's happening with nitrogen fixation. Exactly. exactly. Which is what's happening with kudzu on? to a point because it's in the pea family. But yeah. it's like what's but, actually happening in there with the beings that are in co cove yeah see together. the question is does kudzu have the same nodules with nitrogen fixing bacteria that that yeah. our indigenous pe family species do not all of them but some of them um and i don't know that answer but that i'd be curious about that i mean not as a way to bad vibe kudzu just as a way to understand what's happening yeah. where it's taking a place in the ecosystem and i don't have any problem with saying that invasive species are here with us forever because they are that's the truth um 
people argue a lot about in the West about horses, are they wild or feral? Because horses evolved on this continent oh. many millions of years ago. Just like camels did too. But yes, Eohippus. <laughs> but then conditions changed and they died out and they left. So are they a native species or not? And the people who love feral horses, and there I made a value judgment because that's how I see it, because I studied the desert for a long time. <laughs> the people who love feral horses say, well, no, they, they belong here. They, you know, they originally evolved here. And I would say, but they didn't evolve with the ecosystems that we have now. Mm-hmm. And that's the difficulty. And you can actually show how damaging they can be to those ecosystems. Horses totally trash desert springs, for instance, in the part of the Chihuahuan Desert where I lived for seven years. Um, we were losing pupfish, the little tiny endemic fish, to the desert springs that are persisting from glacial times when the big dry mm-hmm. basins were mm-hmm. shallow glacial lakes. These little tiny fish, um, and I do mean tiny because the, the longest they get is less than two inches long, um, very colorful, very well adapted to warm and highly saline water, but they moved from those big playa lakes as they dried up into the springs and have persisted in springs well, that are sometimes like... 50 feet long, and yet there'll be a population of endemic pupfish in them. You let um, horse populations grow in places like that, and because, just simply because of the way they use the springs, they um, shallow out the channels, and um, the, the springs tend to dry up towards the, the source where they come out of the earth. And that um, can cause a pupfish population to go extinct in a matter of a few years. And of course, there's probably less water to go around so the horses are gravitating there? Yes. Because that's a yes. nice place well, to be. They are gravitating there because horses are not actually desert adapted. Um, mm. So they have to hang around springs. Whereas a bighorn sheep, for instance, can drink every four or five days. A horse has to drink every day. And quite a bit. Um, so a horse will take in... I used to have this figure on the top of my head and I don't have it now. So I'm not going to try and quote it. But if you think of the size of a horse, if a horse is you know, somewhere around um, 800 pounds... And when you think of a human, we have to drink at 110 pounds. We have to drink a gallon of water every day, let's say. Um, Multiply that 100 by the factor that takes you to 800 and multiply that gallon by that same factor and you have a lot of water. So you have a small band of, of, say, 12 feral horses and you just took a lot of water out of that desert spring and the next one is 40 miles away. So it's a huge, huge <clears throat> change to that little important riparian zone. And in the desert, um, <clears throat> permanent water sources are, well, we've lost 95% of our riparian habitat in the desert in the last 50 years. I don't really because, realize that much. Yeah. Once electricity hit the rural parts of the Southwest and farmers could pump electric, could use electric pumps to pump groundwater, groundwater in parts of especially southern New Mexico and southern Arizona has dropped between 50 and several hundred feet below the surface, and that's what supplies those springs. So once it drops that far down, springs dry up. So we've lost lots and lots and lots. Really, the majority of our riparian areas outside the mountain islands in the, in the open desert um, are gone. You know, groundwater is super interesting, and that's also something I've written about when I was writing about the deserts. Because we started in the West legally allocating surface water way back in the late 1800s. But groundwater, until in most states um, 30 or 40 years ago, was totally unregulated. So you could stick a straw, the proverbial, you know, steel pipe. You could drill down, stick a steel pipe in, put an electric pump on it, and pump as much as you wanted Mm -hmm. and not have any kind of legal consequences. So basically you could suck a whole aquifer dry and no one would do anything. And really it's only been in the last 20 years that we've gotten a handle on how much groundwater we lost. Um, And what there isn't, it doesn't get recharged. It's mostly what we call fossil water. It dates back to the Pleistocene Mm -hmm. when there were glaciers and there wasn't necessarily more precipitation, but the climate was cooler, so there was less evaporation. Mm -hmm. And there were big playa lakes in the basins in the southwest. They were shallow, but at the fault zones along the edges of the mountains, they recharged the groundwater. Well, they're gone now. And then Mm -hmm. we sucked that groundwater down. 
And it's not so much that the rainfall can't make it there, there's not enough of it yeah. to get there. Um, it can still, like, if you've ever been in the desert and watched a stream come tumbling out of the mountains and be on the surface and on the surface and then it gets to the bajada, that skirt of sediment between the mountains and the flat basin, and then it's gone, it's dropping into the fault zone that created those mountains, literally the cracks in the earth, and it's running into the groundwater. There just isn't enough of it to bring the groundwater back at the rate we're using it. So what defines a desert is that the annual loss of water through evaporation, either through plants or just out of the soil, is greater than the precipitation that falls in any given year, and sometimes by as much as like 10 times. So if you think about the Atacama Desert um, in South America and Peru and Northern Chile, that in an average year, I think the Atacama gets maybe two inches of precipitation, but the sun is always shining on it and the air is always thirsty, sucking moisture out of the ground. And so the evaporative loss is much, much larger than that two inches. And when the Atacama has those super blooms that you see the great photos of with <clears throat> all those annual wildflowers carpeting it, that's because for a moment, enough rain fell. And those plants are so optimized to taking advantage of when the resources are there, when there's enough water there, when there's enough water and the air is warm enough, they just, the seeds can persist for decades and decades until those conditions are right. And they sprout and they party hardy. They don't conserve water at all. Mm -hmm. They just use it until it's gone and make more seeds, which can then persist for decades and decades and decades. The resilience of those kinds of landscapes where you think there's no life, like you yeah. said, that book, the title, Around the Chihuahua and Desert. Like, yeah. I'm assuming that's kind of a play on words. when you... It's actually a quote from an early U.S. Mm -hmm. Mexican, the first commissioner of the U.S.-Mexico Boundary Survey, John Bartlett, a um, political appointee who, among other things, had been a shopkeeper in Baltimore. Um, was appointed the boundary surveyor of the first survey of the U.S.-Mexico boundary after the Mexican-American War in the early 1840s. And he set off from um, what is now um, the mouth of the, of the Rio Grande um, mm -hmm. on the Gulf of Mexico in a light traveling buggy with surveyors and soldiers to survey the entire border all the way to Southern California because <laughs> it was not mapped. And um, as it turned out, by the time they got to the Chihuahuan Desert in southern New Mexico, and there's a whole thing about he had dinner with his counterpart in Mexico and in Ciudad Juarez and um, gave away quite a bit of the southern border of what is now the U.S. Um, over that dinner um, <laughs> because of an error in his survey calculations. But he's tooling across the... He, he, took, he wrote in his journal the whole way, and he's tooling across um, actually the lower um, Meanbrace River, south of the Gila Wilderness, um, south and east of Silver City, New Mexico, on a June day in his black traveling suit and his black silk top hat. And June in the Ooh. Chihuahuan Desert is about as hot as it gets during the day. That's not the clothing you'd want to wear. And at the end of the day, he is so hot. You know, it's maybe been 105 that day in the sun, and he's wearing black, which means he's hotter than it absorbs 25% more heat than white. Um, so he's pretty damn hot, and he writes in his journal that um, they saw, and I'm paraphrasing, nothing of interest all day, and the landscape is um, is of no redeeming value whatsoever. It is an expanse of territory that is barren, wild, and worthless. And I was reading his journal, and I went, bingo, that's how people see the Chihuahuan Desert. So A lot of deserts in general. Yes. Especially you caught the... Is something I think about a lot being from the east and how different it is and the lushness you know there's such a contrast that if you're like in the colonization of North America like coming with this idea that you can use as much water as you want because you can basically do that in the east yeah coming with this idea of what a good landscape is what right. a fertile landscape is what a Green. valuable landscape is Green. right Green. <laughs> and then like with that perception then going west and taking those things west you know even the ideas that deserts are not like yeah like what people indigenous peoples were doing in those deserts got overlooked totally yes. right like that they weren't even doing it anything useful it didn't fit the perspective and it's that yeah. goes back to that whole idea that 
our way of living on these landscapes is so shaped by the beliefs we bring with us, the baggage mm -hmm. we carry. Um, whether we're talking about invasive plants and animals or whether we're talking about restoration or whether we're talking about agriculture or mining or anything, beavers or whatever, it's all shaped by the perspective we carry with us. Um, the Western writer Wallace Stegner said, um, to successfully live in the West, you have to get over the color green. You don't get it as much. <laughs> because if, if all you're after is green, you're never going to be happy here. You know, you're going to be you're going to be Salt Lake City and environs with all those green lawns, um, which are, in the words of um, of um, um, oh, I can't think of his name right now, author of of Bringing Nature Home, um, and an entomologist from Maryland who studies okay. urban wildlife habitat. Um, lawns are toxic deserts for wildlife, and they also waste a heck of a lot of water. Somewhere around 60% of our treated residential water supplies in the West go to maintain lawns. The whole like philosophy of the lawn is another, mm. <laughs> like yeah. where it came from, you know, the English mm -hmm. garden and the sheep, European. Sheep nibbled turf like showed that you were an aristocrat. And mm -hmm. the sense of like colonizing, mm -hmm. Bring you know colonizers bringing what's familiar to them mm -hmm. into foreign landscapes and wanting to recreate what felt safe around them, right? Yes. There was like that whole thing. And exactly. of course, in the East, you kind of it takes a little less effort to create, to have a lawn. Even though my dad's a horticulturalist, he loves lawns. It had to be this kind of grass, not crabgrass, not this grass. Right, this grass. We now know that lawns though contribute to regional flooding. We know that lawns yeah. contribute to the pollution, say in Chesapeake Bay, that smothers the oyster beds. You know, there's all these. All these other things about lawns. That's the landscaping that made us feel comfortable. It also, I think, made us feel like we had tamed yeah. the landscape. And that was a huge value for people. Still is for a lot of people. That's like an undercurrent um, there yes. that we don't even think to look at a lot yeah. of the time when we even think about things like conservation sometimes. Yeah. Or this bison cow thing. Yes. You know, the cows. There's also like the fear of brucellosa. That's another element, you know. And Which, there, and of course, the elk potentially could carry it too but they love the elk because you can hunt that's right that. you can hunt the elk, you're a big yes. man if you hunt an elk right. and there's so much and there's there's right. no um there's never been a documented transmission of brucellosis between bison yeah. and elk or cattle but it's still this huge fear um which fascinates me because that's really about wildness you know yeah. and if you look up it's really interesting chaos uncontrolled not being able to control yeah. the bison not yeah. being able to control something the lawns are about control exactly yeah. and if you look up the definition of wildness or wilderness um, in an, any ordinary dictionary it's all negative it's all about untamed it's all about these words that have negative connotations even if their exact definition isn't negative the connotation is negative it's all about untamed wild um, difficult to access, you know, it's just like all these pejoratives as opposed to, huh, there's this whole field of research about um, vitamin N, nature, and all the benefits that time out in nature gives us, ranging from lowered blood pressure, lower heart rates, better we're called evolved decision animals. making. We're evolved Yeah, with exactly. the land. We evolved, like, with, <laughs> we evolved with all those other species. We want to see leaves flittering and smell yeah. the dirt. You know, that's it's good for us. Our genetics are evolved yeah. to that. Right? Yeah, and there are, there are programs in prisons now that loop continuous videos of nature to help calm prisoners. Um, because wow. being contained within walls where you can't even hear the outside, um, even the people noises, makes you crazy. And so that need for nature is innate in who we are. Um, and yet when we think about wildness, it's pejorative. I mean, I've had a lot of conversations about wilderness and wildness on the podcast. And of course, you've, one side of it, you have like romanticism of wilderness and wildness. And wilderness is really created in America, right? Like in North America, the concept of a place that was unpeopled and pristine, really unpeopled in the sense of ignoring the impact that indigenous peoples had in their tending practices, like yes. fire and like yes. plantings and moving, you know, things and coppicing, basket weaving, you know, da, da, da. Yes. it ignores and erases that history. But it also, in this idea of what is pristine, like where people aren't, but then if there's people, most of these places at some point, what does that mean? You know, and the whole conversation about what is good land or not. I mean, even right. in your 
thought process around like the bison bringing seeds up why do we want care more about protecting that than exactly what's down here yeah. right why is this just yeah. a sacrifice zone now yeah. all those things are part of that too and then i think for me so there's like this romanticism of these places because after we've got we got to a certain point and realized oh we actually need to you know the era of like the Ro- teddy roosevelt doing like okay wait we need to probably like set aside some of this land or we're gonna not have anything left you know what and part of that's romanticizing the frontier of what was experienced when right. white people first came west and wanting to keep some of that and so that you can go and experience what that was like or whatever there's like some weirdness in that <laughs> that's there but it's also like well it's true we don't want to mess we don't want to drill oil i mean that's still that kind of stuff is still being pushed like into these protected spaces you know of course yes we want to preserve it we, the wildness the self-willedness the pristineness the, the 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 less impacted cemented out places right at the same time it just begs us to ask why is this side of the fence less valuable right you know than like, the other side of the fence. why is this wild and this not and that's yeah. the thing that i've spoken to a lot on the podcast and different gone different directions with it like you know um and so there's a sense of being f- fearful of wildness there's a sense of being also, fearful of wildness, and there's also a sense of, of revering wildness. And they're like two ends of the same spectrum, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that that whole question of what's wild and what's not, what's valuable and what's not, goes back to what we've been circling around this whole conversation mm-hmm. is there we are, we're making value judgments. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time teaching people how to restore um, functioning indigenous plant communities in their yards as a way to provide habitat for pollinators and songbirds because um, we have 44 million acres of lawn in this country and even if a small percentage of them were returned to native native plant species indigenous plant species we would reweave some of the community that we've destroyed by by lawning our urban and suburban areas and that's super important habitat and people say but but you know I live in I don't know, pick a place, Paonia, and just uphill, it's wild. Why would I need to do anything in my yard? And the answer is because for all the little critters, that piece of your yard, even if it's an eight by 10 piece, could be the habitat they need to survive. So we have, for instance, in this um, country, over 4,000 species of native bees, and many of them are critical pollinators for our food plants, as well as, and that's our self-interest, but we're humans, we respond to our self-interest, but they're also critical pollinators for our wilder landscapes, mm-hmm. which are reservoirs of biodiversity in this country. Um, they're basically reservoirs of the health we need to survive as a species. So preserving those pollinators is super important. And as a bee biologist, um, Gordon Frankie at the University of, of California, Berkeley said when I was interviewing him for an article for Audubon magazine, um, if we can take eight by 10 feet of our gardens here in urban Berkeley and provide the indigenous plants that keep a native bee species alive, we've just made wildness right in our yards. It's a tiny patch, but it's super valuable in the biodiversity sense because we've given habitat to a species we might otherwise lose. That's one of the many relationships that weave a healthy ecosystem. So in your yard, you can give yourself wildness on a very small scale without sacrificing if you want to have the rest of it lawn fine. And it fascinates me that we as humans can't see that scaling thing. Um, Doug Tallamy, the entomologist whose name I was trying to think of, um, came up with the, what does he call it, Um, backyard national park idea, which is that if the majority of people in any given urban area devote just a small space to rewilding, reintroducing indigenous plant species, that could connect enough habitat over a huge part of the United States that we could turn around the declines, steep declines in pollinators and songbirds on whom we depend for our mental health as well as many other things. And so that kind of turns on its head the idea that wild has to be big, it has to be distant, has to have snowy peaks. Wild could actually be a chunk of your backyard and it could be a way to reintroduce yourself to 
terraphilia to our inborn affection for and connection to this earth and all of its species. Yet we're so socialized out of seeing wild there that we get in our cars and drive somewhere so we can be in nature when actually we're in freaking nature all the time. Nature lives in us. We are ecosystems. There are more non-human cells in our bodies by a factor of 10 than there are <laughs> human cells. Our microbes outnumber us greatly and we're dependent on them for the health of our skin, for the health of our guts, for our mental health, for all sorts of things. Far more than we realize, we're actually walking ecosystems. And yet, when we think of wild and nature in a positive way and we want to experience it, we go somewhere else. Which I find totally fascinating and very it's frustrating. It's out there. Yes, <laughs> it's out there somewhere else. I mean, yeah. that's definitely a big, you know, again, being from the East and the Southeast, you don't have as much public land. It's yeah. like, especially in the Piedmont going towards the coast where I'm from, it's like you have a couple wildlife management areas which are set aside for hunting yes. for the most part. Yes. And then the Army Corps of Engineers owns and runs certain things which is super economic based, right? It's about yes. energy creation or something like right. that. And there's some rec recreation in there which is also an economic piece. Rare and some state parks, you know. Yeah. And then in the mountains you get you get more national parks and national forest and stuff. Yeah. And there's no BLM east of the Mississippi. No, because but, BLM land came about because we bought the West, and this is a fascinating construct of human history. We purchased the West from France in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. We bought the West, not that France owned it, it right. was already <laughs> inhabited by thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. But in our cultural construct, we bought the West from France, and thus, the federal government owned most of the land. And that meant that even after the big land giveaways, which of course, again, this is land that we took from the indigenous people um, and went on a concentrated campaign to eradicate the people themselves, um, after the big federal land giveaways, we still had public land left. And that's, um, other than what was declared as national parks, national forests, national monuments, and national wildlife refuges, that's the Bureau of Land Management land. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have it west of the Mississippi and back east. It doesn't exist because there wasn't that purchase of half a continent from a country that didn't own it to begin with. And yeah, the colonization in the east, people got sent over, and there was land grant, like my family in Southern Virginia has been there like seven generations and mm -hmm. some of them totally got like land grant land mm -hmm. from England for free right yes. like here take this do something thousands of acres originally it's not that much now but it's like there's a little less like they just there wasn't any like oh we there wasn't like a line where it right. ended or it's yeah. just like oh you got here you can survive okay put your fruit trees in yeah all right, you fine, you know, and it just changed in time. I mean, when they made national parks, they did have to, they did kick out people in Virginia, the Shenandoah, Scott Irish settlers, you know, mm -hmm. who had been there. They did mm -hmm. kick those people out um, to make that park, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. Other layer of, you know, yes. those people were considered lesser humans, well, according yeah, to were. the English, too, but, like... They were Scots-Irish. I'm, I'm half Scots. I totally get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Highlander. Yes, my people left because we were pushed out of the biggest state. Yeah. We were, sh you know, we were basically um, small farmers in the biggest states, and when the enclosures happened um, in Scotland and Ireland, we got pushed out. Mm -hmm. The other half of me is Norwegian from the what was then the third world part of Norway, which was the fjord country, which is gorgeous, but the strip of farmland between the fjords and the steep cliffs and then the high alpine was tiny. And as people had kids and divided their little small holdings up into tinier and tinier pieces, you couldn't make a living there. And my granddad just took off as a merchant marine guy, jumped ship in Detroit, got himself a job in the auto industry, and took his engineering degree into the steel industry because he could make a living in America, whereas he couldn't in Norway on his, on his family's tiny, tiny farm. Very scenic, but, you know, the three fjord horses and two cows and a dozen apple trees and the cod fishing only went so far. So. I know colonization 
it's not that simple as to say white people just came over here and stole everything. It's really like there's so many, so many layers, so many layers of each story and yep. each actual like ethnic origin. Oh of yeah, because some white from. people were people and some white people weren't people. Yeah, <laughs> I come from the cultures that weren't people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, you know. So, but I'm still white, so yeah. I still have a huge advantage on, say, the Chinese who came to work the railroads and then were banned from doing anything and eventually... Had their land taken or whatever. Yeah, you know. their laundries were burned down and that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, you know, and, and that was a step above being, say, Mexican or being, say, indigenous. You know, it's just, we have, we have, as a history, humans have this tribalness that develops into hierarchies and we do the same thing with other species. You're good, you're not. You know, you're in the tribe, you're not, thus you're bad. And it's the same thing in circling back around to invasive species. Yeah. There's a value judgment there. There is an important ecological truth there too, but it's how we apply it where the value judgment comes into being. You know, you can say, look, we have lost about 50% of the sea and sagebrush in the West to cheatgrass invasion. And cheatgrass being an annual that is a winter annual that germinates before our indigenous plants. It takes the nutrients and water out of the soil before they get going. It dies as soon as the water dries out in late spring and it, it's entirely flammable. You can look sideways at a cheatgrass stand and it will burst into flame practically. So cheatgrass causes very frequent fires. Our indigenous bunch grasses and sagebrush are not adapted to that. They've burned out by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres. We were talking about this cheatgrass a little bit at the book. That's where we met at, um, when this bookstore, which is where we're hosting this conversation right now, Thank Paonia you, Books. Emily Sinclair of Paonia Books. <laughs> but there was like an opening evening thing. And yes. You, we were by the cider, hard cider table. Yes. And we started talking about cheatgrass. And, you know, for me... I don't necessarily want to like call plants evil or bad, like and assume that they actually mean harm. They're just like, responding to the conditions that are exactly. there, right? And so with this, it's like we were taught. We ended up talking about prairie dogs, bison, fire, like I. <laughs> There's a great ranching, and I talk about these things with people all the time who actually are willing to talk about them with me. I just like connecting with people about this stuff, and I'm thinking about: is it the cheat grass responding to the lack of bison? and the overgrazing with cattle or these other things that we've also done, deforestation or whatever, what is also happening besides the fact that cheatgrass is responding? I mean, cheatgrass, is it, yeah, you cheatgrass know? is the messenger. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that we can allow the messenger to mm -hmm. take over. So cheatgrass is the messenger about deteriorating conditions in the sagebrush sea. Um, and that's partly overgrazing, it's partly dewatering by pumping groundwater. There's a whole bunch of factors at play there. Cheatgrass um, is a Eurasian grass that evolved actually um, with wheat, early early agriculture of wheat. Mm -hmm. um, on the dry side of the Ural Mountains, which are a north-south mountain range that splits um, Asia off from Europe, and the dry side, the east side, is where cheatgrass evolved. So it came from environments very similar to ours. It came as a contaminant of um, agriculture seed and possibly even on the fur of imported agricultural animals, sheep, cows, and it's been able to take over huge swaths of the West because of how we've mistreated the sagebrush sea. Um, the tragedy is that cheatgrass itself has changed the conditions within the sagebrush sea and eliminated probably 55% of the intact sagebrush ecosystems over the Western US. There's 150 vertebrate species dependent for part or all of their lives on, cheekra, on, on sagebrush. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you take out 55% of their habitat just from fires created by cheatgrass or encouraged by cheatgrass, um, you've lost a lot of habitat. And then you add oil and gas drilling and road building and suburbs and you know agriculture and all the other things that have been hard on the sagebrush ecosystems. And you have an ecosystem that we once took for granted as being endless. Mm -hmm. Sagebrush was once the most common shrub in, the United, in, in North America, mm -hmm. um, and it is no longer um, by a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Then that's when the prominence of cheatgrass starts coming into view for people who would like to restore some of that sagebrush ecosystem and keep the rest of it from being eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, Sagebrush is not like our mountain forests in the West, at all adapted to fire. 
it was not a fire dependent ecosystem. The shrub itself does not regenerate after fire except by seed. So if you have a fire that takes out 100,000 acres of cheatgrass, of, of sagebrush, if you have a cheatgrass fire, um, then you've lost your seed source over that whole area. You would have to go in and hand seed and have the right conditions for the seed to germinate to seed. get back that ecosystem. And the tragedy of cheatgrass is that it's adapted to frequent fire, um, fire every two or three or four or five years. And so nothing more long-lived can get a hold again because the cheatgrass, um, one small cheatgrass plant, one stem can have 75 seeds at maturity. And it takes it six to eight weeks to mature, die, shatter, drop the seeds on the ground, and for them to be ready to germinate. <laughs> um, so it's a plant that's optimized for the conditions we have created by abusing the sagebrush mm -hmm. ecosystem. It's not a bad plant, but it's very much a plant that is having super bad effects just by being itself on the ecosystem and threatening a lot of, a lot of um, the ecological health of huge swaths of the West. If you've ever driven um, the interstate between, say, the Snake River in southern Idaho and Boise on a day that was windy and seen the soil wafting through the air by the megaton. It's pretty depressing in that area. <laughs> That's where the sagebrush is burned off and the perennial grasses, wow. the bunch of grasses that went with it. That's what a cheatgrass. That's what a cheatgrass ecosystem is like. Ten months of the year, it's bare soil. Wow. An annual grass um, that takes six to eight weeks to mature doesn't hang around. The plant shatters. It doesn't hold the soil with its roots. Its roots are tiny because it's an annual. It doesn't need to invest in roots. It invests in seeds because that's the next generation. So it's not that eat. cheatgrass is bad. It's that cheatgrass's effect on that community has been disastrous. It's like a it's like a massacre. You can eat cheatgrass seed, right? Like, I think. No, the seed's not not, not edible. It has um, awns mm. that stick out of it. Um, the Fox. grass itself, as a winter annual, when it's very, very small, mm -hmm. is quite grazable. The problem is we don't have anybody that grazes it, right, in any kind of large amounts. None of our natives, um, none of our indigenous grazers, Adapt are adapted to cheatgrass because it hasn't been on this continent for long enough for them to really kind of take a hold of it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a characteristic of invasive plants. They don't have the relationships within the ecosystem that allow them to contribute. They might in 10,000 years, but there might not be an ecosystem left in 10,000 years. There would be a whole different one. Mm -hmm. Of course, some of the things that I think about in this conversation with invasive plants, which we spoke to a little bit in that evening we started talking about it is like there's not always a scientifically measured agreement about what that is I mean the way the plants behaving in an existing ecosystem is is one measure but other people say it's merely that it's introduced but not all introduced plants behave that way and then, right. then some people say it's purely behavior so it doesn't really matter whether it's introduced or not which is it's so fascinating to me in that cultural piece like out east <laughs> we've got gold, goldenrod they'll call invasive and it's a native plant or That's junipers like, virginiana which of yeah. course we talked about right. with the depending on the area where the junipers are you, they call the utah juniper in the great basin invasive they call the, the ash juniper in texas invasive they call junipers virginiana the eastern red cedar invasive because of fire suppression because of all these reasons why there's more of them that maybe there were 300 years ago yeah. but it's with some things i'm like that's <clears throat> fascinating to me even here they call the three-leaf sumac invasive i'm like I've never heard it called that. That's interesting. Well, this person's land who I'm on told me that that's sentiment he's heard a lot. Oh. You know, it's that's interesting. Yeah. People keep coming to him and saying, cut that down in your front yard. It's bad. And I'm like, he's like, why? You know, yeah. so it just depends on, it's partly, sometimes the cultural piece that comes in is about its inconvenience to something we want to do. Exactly. Like sometimes the juniper, it affects the economics of the land, like the ability to graze cows on it, right? So there's or, a sense or that it's, it's flammability. Yeah, it's flammability. Um, yeah. yeah. So th that goes back to the word weed, which I really would like to excise from our vocabulary mm -hmm. because it's so loose. It, it has different definitions depending on who's using it. And invasive really actually has a definition scientifically um, the Invasive Species Council, the U.S. Invasive Species Council has defined it, and it's that behavioral definition. It's not just that it doesn't, 
it's not just that it's a plant from another place brought here or an animal oh. from another place brought here. It's that it's actually destructive to the ecosystems where it finds itself. And how is that not cultural sometimes? Because well, if it's about co-evolution and an ecology, it's like, well... Except that it's not, in, in our time frame, it's not co-evolving. So cheatgrass, for instance, isn't co-evolving in the West. It's simply taking over. But the juniper species, there's not any introduced junipers in the U.S., Yes, that's, but they're but co they're not, So but, they're not an invasive you know. species by this definition. Yeah, but that's you know, but, how that's oh. how people in their own particular right. self interest are using. The Oklahoma, more. I looked because I taught a class on the ethnobotany of juniper recently, yeah. and I looked up the invasive species list for like the entire Midwest. Oklahoma has it on there. Nebraska, like it's, and they have whole things that they've got tons of funding for. Like I have this one yes. that's fascinating. This eastern. Or it's, it's like in Nebraska where it's, I think it's still mostly western or eastern red cedar, which is Junipers virginiana, right. but there's, Texas has like eight species, so there's a yeah. few that come up, but they're like, they have a whole, and you can see like 10 different people funded, including the Nature Conservancy, including yeah. Cattle Ranching Association, totally. all these people yeah. funded this thing to put out to tell people, and it said the... It was like the greatest threat, eastern red cedar, you know. And it's fascinating. To so that I would say that's a, a use of invasive that I don't appreciate. And that's where it gets I tricky know, and all of it. You know? But th that goes back again to what we're saying. This is all cultural. You yeah. know, these definitions are cultural. And that's a function of its people using them. And that's how we use language. Yeah. I would say for, for Juniperus virginiana and then some of the Texas species, what we've got going on there is kind of like cheatgrass in the sense that Juniper's the messenger. It's mm -hmm. telling us that we've managed the prairies badly, um, that we've done a really bad job of listening to the ecosystem and knowing what it needs. One thing we've done is prohibited fire. Another thing we've done is annihilated by the hundreds of millions prairie dogs, which are root feeders. And there's now some really interesting research coming out of Texas about woody species moving into grasslands. And <clears throat> this is true especially, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, this is true, especially mesquite, um, mesquite for, example. for example, which is considered um, invasive, even though it's native. Yeah, right? and that's, that's another I would one. say it's a misuse of the term, but but that's splitting hairs. That's a cultural thing again. Um, right. But when we um, annihilated prairie dogs to make the um, prairie safe for um, our domestic livestock, mm -hmm. cows and horses. Um, we annihilated the root feeders who were keeping those woody species from moving in. Hmm. And we totally changed the character. There's, there is um, part of the Chihuahuan Desert was originally a bunch of grass grasslands, and it's now mesquite hummocks, um, where the mesquites are the only thing that's holding the sandy soil from blowing away. Um, and what once was an expanse of grassland, and you read the early, um, you read the early um, European explorers' descriptions, and they're talking about, you know, grasses tall enough to tickle their horses' bellies. <laughs> Um, they're not talking about the whole grass plant being that tall, I would point out. They're talking about the flower stalk, and that's mm -hmm. after the summer rains. But still, grassland, where what is now there is mesquite shrubs with hummocks of sand around their bases where it provides wind protection and nothing in between until the summer rains come and the annuals bloom. So very huge change in those ecosystems. And probably, mostly, we used to blame it on the big cattle drives, and now the sense is that that's actually mostly or killing off prairie millions dogs. and millions of prairie dogs. And to get people yeah. to want to reintroduce prairie dogs would be an interesting cultural project There's, because there is so much hate of them you still couldn't get. Well, it's not no different than beavers. Poisons to pour same, in their holes. And, same, you know, same thing yeah. with beavers. It's a long uphill slog. But to me, that's part of what makes this discussion interesting is when we see, oh, we just made a black and white judgment about a species, yeah. and we totally screwed ourselves by doing it. How do we change that now? We have to start confronting our, our, our tendency to say good or bad. Mm -hmm. Because really the world is all on a continuum, and good or bad, like the new physics, is going to depend on where you stand on the room and how you feel about the world. What you learned as inherited beliefs Mm -hmm. You know, what your religious system is, all sorts of things. There is no good and bad in the actual world, the real world of species interacting. The good and bad is a human construct. We can say, if we have good research, 
behind it, solid research, we can say, in this situation, this species is wreaking havoc. And we have to figure out some way to change the way we've handled this ecosystem, the way we've worked with it, lived with it, in order to reintroduce some measure of health so that this particular species doesn't turn it into a cheatgrass monoculture, for instance. Um, that we can say. How we go about it, we're back in that messy thicket again. Mm -hmm. But we can't say a species is good or bad. Mm -hmm. We can say its effects on an ecosystem are not what we were hoping for. Um, we can say that in our understanding of the community health, this particular species is having a deleterious effect on the health. But we can't say you're bad and you're good. We shouldn't do that with people either, and we do it all the time. Yeah. So we're back to that whole thorny thicket of how humans behave, which is we are hardwired to classify. I think what I had thought I would be focusing on, and this was not invasive plants, but I know that's a big topic of yours, and I've talked about it a lot on the podcast anyways. Um, it was like, but I mean, I'm so grateful that we're talking about it right now, was... I was like gonna ask you because I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts you've done with other people and like a lot of your talking and then a talk you did about like how unpersonal science writing can be and as a scientist that's now a writer who just wrote a, you put out a memoir and like it's really emotional and there's always like things about trauma I mean you, the land stuff is like inherent probably for you and all of your writing like you can't not have that that's like the map of beingness right but for me, also as someone who writes in a super geeky scientific way and also in a very emotive, like, I'm a, I study philosophy and religion, so there's like always like the cultural piece, always the like human relationship piece, the the inner ecosystem piece to everything. It's like, I'm always grappling too with that like intellectual versus emotional. But when even in this conversation, it's like, we you can't actually just talk about science without analyzing culture, without analyzing yes. human relationships and human sentiments and attachments because right we're bringing lawns across turtle island because there is an emotional somatic attachment right. to the lawn and right. a fear it becomes so intimate and that's a thing i think sometimes a problem in the field of science is like we're just this objective even though it's actually not like you're saying in the inherently in the end yeah. anyways we might as well just change how we're talking about it i think we I, have to because that's how we're, not, we're gonna get at the right yeah not the right because there is, if you said there's not really a right it's There's just not a right or just a wrong. asking a lot of good questions is like what i tend to think about because i'm not teaching a class on the ethnobotany of juniper to give people a bunch of facts to memorize i'm like well what are the questions we need to be asking about our current relationships with juniper based on the things that have happened exactly. in the past like that's actually ethnobotany Yes. You know? So, exactly. And there is yeah. an emotional piece. There is absolutely an emotional piece because we're always making value judgments about everything yeah. because we're humans. Yeah. That's what we do. And especially in this particular culture, that's what we do. Um, I, I One of the things about writing that's been wonderful for me is um, it's given me the freedom to find a way out of the box that can be science. So yeah. as a female in science, um, and as a female of a certain age, I'm 66 this year, um, I had a kind of rocky relationship with science as a younger woman because I wasn't appreciated by my fellow males. Um, I was usually the only woman in the room. Mostly white men too, probably. Yes. Um, I was usually the only woman in the room. I was often um, mistaken for the secretary who should bring the coffee. <laughs> um, and that there's nothing wrong with being a secretary, I want to point out, whatever gender you are, it's a wonderful role. Um, but it wasn't me. Um, so I adopted a more male persona to try and fit in. And it took me quite a while to figure out that was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So one of the lovely things writing gave me was the freedom to step back and look at how I was interacting with the science that, you know, science is my second language. I grew up in a family that studied nature. Um, I come from a family culture of people who study nature. My great-grandfather was a botanist who moved to Tucson in 1903, September 13th of 1903, to study the North American deserts. 
um, Anna Carnegie. It's in your genes. Foundation. It's in your it, blood. It's in my, it's certainly in my memes, certainly in my right, culture right, yeah. that I grew up in. Yeah. Um, so that's very much, science is very much my second language, my, my background culture. But I had to step back from it, and that's what writing gave me the freedom to do, to see how we use science, to see how I've used science, to see where I wanted to see, to see where I, I knew I wanted to go differently. And part of that is putting, taking a reflective look at my culture, what biases that gives me, um, and using that reflection to be a better scientist and also a better writer, to reflect my culture to my readers, to reflect our culture and how we live on these lands, why we seem to be unable to become part of the community of these lands, um, and how we can change the way we are in order to be, to be, to belong. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's super important. We live as if we'll trash where we are and just blow along like tumbleweeds. Um, we'll find the next good place. And to me, to be able to figure out how to actually belong, to be um, participating members of the community that contribute positively, both the human community and the natural community, and they're not separate, they're interwoven, um, that's, that's my life's work is to help people reintegrate and drop feeling guilty because we can actually be part of this community, because we can actually contribute positively if we're careful about how we live and thoughtful about how we live with each other as humans and with the land, the community of the land we belong to. So to me, that's like my whole life's work. And, and one of the wonderful things about um, taking up writing has been it's given me the freedom to step back and, and look at how I behave, how the mm -hmm. rest of us behave, and and use the knowledge of science as a way to show people there are different ways to go about it. Yeah, I think a lot about the relationship to grief and relating to land in the current day. And I haven't read your book that you just put, so you put out, <laughs> but I have a feeling there's some relationship it's there. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot of relationship I'm going there. to get it. And it's probably here in the bookstore because you did a talk here like it is last week. <laughs> so, um, but like... We can't, like, if we don't have, if we're not allowed to feel grief about what's happening in the land, or if we're not, it's not even, we're not even allowed to feel grief sometimes in our own human relational world, yes. much less, yes. and it's okay and, like, not uncomfortable for people, but that's, sick. for me, it often brings up, eco, the ecological grief and the personal life grief are all merged together. They're and, absolutely not separable. And, and the like, ecological grief is because we're living our lives the way we are as humans. I mean, they're, they're not they're part and parcel of each other and until we learn to um, embrace ourselves as we are not as who we would like to be or who we hope to be or who we expect ourselves to be but until we embrace ourselves as who we are we won't be able to live well live mm -hmm. with terraphilia live with love for the places we are and the other inhabitants thereof which are not just humans um, until we learn to grieve until we learn that loss is a part of life and we learn the lessons from loss, we learn to sit with a dying person and feel the pain and grace involved in that transition, we won't be able to be a sustainable species on this earth. Um, the poet, the German poet, um, uh, his name is one of my head, Rilke, Mm. Um, said, and I'm going to paraphrase because I can't remember it exactly, that it's not that we have to love death, but we have to embrace it in a way that we understand it as the other half of life. And until we get over this irrational belief that death and grief and the harder parts of life are something we should ignore, pretend doesn't exist, spend a lot of money denying. Um, or there should be a timeline, or there should be a certain way that it's expressed that's right. within a comfortable bounds right. for other people. Aren't you over that yet? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I've heard that one. It's Plenty. the worst <laughs> phrase in the, or in you're the just, human lexicon. Yeah. yeah. You're people wallowing. will say things, you're wallowing, you're throwing a fit, you're... Yeah. 
yeah. your I don't know your your grief is inappropriate, right? Like I mean, would you say that to, in some cultures, like at funerals, people throw themselves on the dead body, yes. wailing. I mean, wail. that would yes. be really uncomfortable for a lot of Americans who experience. I well, think. But, because we don't we don't accept that the harder feelings are as valid as the easy ones, mm-hmm. um, and we also don't. I think generally European cultures, although some Southern European cultures are great about um, emoting, certainly the cultures I come from, the Northern European cultures are very um, poker-faced. Stoic. You know, stoic, yeah. And that's so not the human condition, especially now. I mean, I'm sorry, there are people who's, who are losing their lives in the Ukraine as Russia bombs it. They're losing their wheat fields. They're losing their houses. They're, you know, they're dying because this crazy guy in Russia thinks that he can control the world. We have people in Somalia starving to death because they're the wrong culture, um, because they've overused the desert, because we don't care. Um, we have people crossing the border by the thousands because countries in South America are falling apart, because there's violence. In part in we caused. <laughs> there's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons to feel grief about this world before we even get to climate change and that crisis and the species we're losing and all of that. There's a lot of grief going on. And if we can't handle that and be real about it and allow ourselves and each other to grieve when we need to, um, we're not going to get anywhere to the species. We're not being human. I think our best, our best quality as humans is not our brains. They get us into trouble. Um, and there's so many things we can't do that other species can. We, we have no idea how to wait out inhospitable decades as a seed. Um, we have no idea how to smell our way home through the ocean after migrating out in the ocean, feeding on little critters for f- three or five years, how to smell our way back to our natal stream by its mineral content, like salmon do. We have no idea how to metamorphose from caterpillar to butterfly rearranging at the cellular level. The one thing we do when we do it well, when we let ourselves do it, is love. Mm -hmm. And that means loving ourselves, each other, and this earth without some expectation of profit or return or particular behavior. It means loving ourselves as we are. It means letting each other grieve. It means letting each other be angry or feel cheated. It means all the spectrum of what it is to be human. And that really is our greatest gift to this world. If we can learn to live with love, I think we can make it as a species. If not, the earth will continue in some form or other without us, just fine. That's really poignant to say that love is also letting grief happen, you know, (laughs) letting the if love is an expression, I mean, grief is an expression of love, but like in loving others, it's also the allowance for people to be what they yes. need to be, right? Yes. And that, yes. It's, it's interesting. I don't often see that. I Sometimes I do, obviously, but I don't often see that actually happening. Yeah. You know, I love you, but like, I'm tired of hear- as seeing soon as you, you say sad. But, as soon as you say, but you're not <laughs> loving someone. That's well, the not even the word part. but yeah. But, but as like, soon as you, make it's basically that what's implied, yeah. right? Like, I love but, you, and I don't want you to be sad. Well, I'm sorry, I have to be sad. So I you love have to love you. me as I am. Yeah, and yeah, that's a problem. You know, that, yeah. That's just something I've been thinking about a lot in my own life, and it's like interesting. How do we deal with collective grief, individual grief? Like, how do we practice? changing our relationship with land by practicing how we change our relationships to love with each other or love with other beings yeah. like the cute dogs in the other room or whatever it's like um and somehow it's all wrapped up it's like i've been thinking about that a lot lately it's all it wrapped up together for me and i'm i'm still not sure like how to sit, say it in a clear way necessarily but it it feels like and i think a lot of people are suicidal and like taking their own lives especially after pandemic and all the weird socialness con- mm-hmm. the isolation of that like it yeah. exacerbated what was already a problem right 
um, well, that we can't collectively share lives together. We can't collectively grieve. We can't like right. what's happening in the world. We're not right. allowed, you know. Yeah. And it, it's isolation makes you crazy. The isolation. Yeah. Yeah, and to whether be whether that's sharing joy or sadness, you know. Well, it has to be both. You know, yeah. we can't expect each other just to be the easy end of the spectrum. The human condition involves the yin and the yang. You know, it's the it's the dark and the light, it's the grief and the joy. It's all of those things all together are what make us human. We can't pick out one trait and say, I love you and I only want this trait, because that denies the whole being. It's this question of are we gonna let ourselves be whole or not? And whole does not mean smiling all the time. Yeah. Whole means sometimes I am super sad. Sometimes I'm grieving. Sometimes I don't want to talk to anybody because I'm mad at the world. Sometimes I want to shout at people because I'm mad at the world. Um, whole is all of that. It's not just the easy, pretty stuff. It's just like whole is, you know, the, the um, poisonous earth from the uranium mines that dot the Four Corners area. That's as whole as the pretty mesas they're on. Whole is all of it. It's not just the parts that are easy for us to like. And that's what love is about. Real love is not about, I love you if, I love you only. That's conditional love. Unconditional love, which is what we do at our best. And I'm not saying we're going to be able to do it every moment of every day, because the whole person can't. Whole is, I love you even when you're shouting at me because you're anxious and your horse wouldn't cross the stream and you think I should have swatted him on the ass and I didn't because I didn't want to get that close to him. Whole is I love you even when you're being unreasonable. Whole is I love you when you're suicidal. Whole is I love you when you're at your most difficult. Whole is I love this earth in the midst of this crisis, in these wars. I still do, every day. Yeah, it's um, it's so interesting. Like I've been in a lot of grief this year over personal life stuff, and there becomes a limit that other people can handle it sometimes, right? And that's partly because they haven't had people hold it for them, right? Yeah, and exactly. And it's too hard. And we can't give what we haven't gotten. We all have. A lot of us have conditions of not having enough community around that, right? Yeah. And it's been interesting to see who. I mean, and yeah, it's a lot. Like who can be continuously present for it in whatever way they can and who are just like, I can't deal yeah. with you anymore. I was, I was curious, like you wrote this book that you put out. Well, I, I don't know. Was it put out really recently or is it just like a couple of years ago? Bless the Birds um, is was April of 2021. So okay, so not too long year, ago. Year but half. you took a while to write it. And I, I didn't know the whole backstory to it, but you had another whole memoir written and then you had to scratch that and start over because... Your husband got um, cancer, and then you had to really like, wait a minute. Actually, this memoir is taking a whole other turn, and that was a big part of the book. And I was like, I mean, thinking about like, what was your experience of people and your grief around that? Right? Like, you're so, you're a scientist. Everything's got to be like objective. <laughs> Except but, like, that I'm not. I'm a you're human a mess. Being. Um, so I've actually written two memoirs and the first one, Walking Nature Home, okay. is literally about resolving my left brain and right brain. Resolving the, the science thing. me and the yeah. creative me, um, the me that is not perfect and all that. And Bless the Birds is, a, is about how we can rise to be our best selves in the hardest times we can imagine. And, and that involves not being perfect. Yeah. Um, and then it involves other people not being perfect with us. Um, it's actually about um, the journey my late husband and I took with his brain cancer. Two mm -hmm. and a half years of thinking he would make it and then he didn't and learning to live well with what we had. Um, my mother died at the same time and I took care of both of them through their deaths in the same year. It was a... Um, mm. I learned a lot. It was a hard year. Um, it was also a beautiful year. Um, that's the yin and the yang. And sometimes those moments were right up next to each other. Um, the beauty. How compassionate and graceful. Really hard. Um, <laughs> do I get right now or how angry do I get? Exactly. Like, and, and how do I forgive myself for being both? Often yeah. in the same moment. Um, 
totally fearful and yet totally able to be open to what was happening um, in the same moment because that's who we are. So writing the book was my way of trying to translate that for other people who might never go through that kind of journey but who might be dealing with a super hard time in their lives and to um, to be the person in the journey as well as the person reflecting on the journey because um, no one's going to go through the same journey I did but I wanted to make it universally applicable to anyone's journey. So I had to both be that me in that moment and the person standing back and reflecting on it, which is pretty hard. Because um, mm -hmm. I'd really like to be the person I would like to be in print rather than the person I actually am. So I spent a lot of time digging through the layers, getting to the me I was at that moment so that I could be real. Um, n nobody wants to read about somebody who's already figured it out. It's not interesting. Like in that moment, I was a mess. Yeah. I was yelling at somebody, I was cursing at them, but now I realize... Yeah, exactly. I didn't really want to um, be like that, but... <laughs> yeah, um, and there's a lot, there's a lot... Memoir is really taking a piece of your life and making sense of it. Um, it's not an A, B, C, D, this is how my life went breath to death. It's this is this chunk of my life, and here's the meaning I took from it upon reflection. It's really based on that kind of reflection. It's also based on facts um, and has a narrative storyline like, like, like fiction does um, and character development and all that kind of stuff. So I spent eight years writing it. <laughs> Not full time. Um, and it, it, I really... I really actually, it came out at exactly the perfect time because of the pandemic, because of global climate change, because of all the things that have made us all in touch with the hard parts of life. And I, my hope for it has been that it will reach people who need a story that gives them an idea for how they can live their life as best possible in these hard times. Mm -hmm. And it apparently has, it's, you know, it's won some awards, which is lovely, but I get, I get emails and messages and um, even letters from people who say, your book saved my life. Hmm. You can't really do better than that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's only 200 people. I don't care. It doesn't have to be 25,000. Um, just that people, it reached people who needed it. And that for me is huge. And it really was a result of my going through the experience and then, and then stepping back and wrestling with myself, forgiving myself for not being perfect in that journey um, and learning what I could learn from it that I could pass on to other people. I say when I teach writing that memoir is um, a process of undressing in public and you get to choose how many layers you want to take off. I'm a very, very private person. So for me, it's really <laughs> being the me I really am in public is um, takes a lot of work. I get that sentiment. That <laughs> I have a lot of layers too, and certain yeah. people that give me permission to open up layers, and other people, to, you know, it just depends, right? Yeah. I, yeah, like I was like looking at some of the stuff that you had. Like there was a talk you did online at one of these writers' conferences, and I listened to that last night, and I'm like, wow, this is exactly what I actually need to hear right now, <laughs> because. And I wrote down some of the things, but I don't even need to look at it. Like, be courageous. Like. Um, vulnerable speak to uh what was it like uh speak speaking truth to power right yeah. i had to look like right like these things that make it like that should be goals i mean what is that what what that looks like is like an onion like like you said like yes. well, how much do you want to undress and that's something i've grappled with as a person that has done, yeah, like I said, I've done like really geeky scientific writing, it's safe, right? It's like, right. I don't necessarily have to go into what I'm feeling in this. But then there's another layer of stuff that I've done growing up in the deep south, like on my grandparents' farm that's still like farming the old way with mules and tobacco and seeing all the ecological destruction and like both this... And figuring out how to write about it has been really hard over the years because for one, I'm scared of pissing off people where I grew up who still... Yeah. Like, are attached to the good old days and yeah. are super conservative. And yeah. I know I go home, everybody knows my, me and my family, yeah. right? Like, I sometimes fear for, like, if I say what I really feel, speaking truth to power <laughs> yeah. in a place with a lot of racism, ecological, like, 
like it's so bad there are the poisons on the land from hundreds yeah. of years my own ancestors have poisoned the land it's like how do I I've been trying to figure out how to write about and I have but like and grapple with the grief and the love there because yeah. I loved my childhood on my grandparents farm yeah while also there's like this dark side of it where yeah that whole life way was dependent on like at some point enslaving yes pe- black folks or having them as sharecroppers in the right. land which there were black sharecroppers even yeah. as a 35 year old until I was 10 years old yeah like how do I how have I, I haven't quite because I've been it's like the courage piece yeah I mean I've written to a point but like I guess there's part of me it's a super hard it's, thing to do <laughs> it's a super hard thing to do but I will say what I've learned is the truth really will set you free yeah and so what I always say um is that Truth is super important, and each of us has our own truth, but being um, being transparent on the page, saying, I am fearful about even saying that, yeah, and I'm fearful for these reasons, and I also want you to understand that I have a great deal of love for these people, for this culture, and this is why. Being able to say that on the page is super powerful. Speak to the complexity of it. Yes, both for you and for your readers. Because what you're doing is modeling a way of being that we need to see more of. And that is not saying you're bad, you're good, right. I know everything, but saying, I loved my childhood on this farm. Now I see the dark side that that was based on. And, and honestly, it's hard for me to write about it because I fear alienating the very people and culture and place that I love. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel I can not write about it. So I write about this with a lot of trepidation. It scares me. We you apply know. the truth, um, which is like turning on the flashlight in your phone. You know, When you turn it on, you're not going to put it in someone's eyes, right? You're going to say, is this truth going to overall be helpful? Or am I just applying it to be harmful? Is this a revenge thing, or is this a thing out of That's love? That's a good thought. It yeah. really <laughs> is. It's a wonderful um, metric to use, to use a scientific term. Um, and I think it's true for us in all of our lives. I, you know, when I look back at myself and the times that I lost my patients with my brain-damaged husband who'd gone through five brain surgeries by the time he died, and his tumor had colonized his whole right brain, and, you know, there's things about being able to map the world no longer, being able to make sense of a computer screen no longer, being able to control his impulses no longer. You know, um, the times I yelled at him because he endangered himself or just frustrated the hell out of me, I look back at that and I go, I wish I'd been different in that moment, but I wasn't, and that's instructive because that's how we are, you know? And I look back at that and I say, do I want to be that person in print? And I say, yeah, because that's how I was. And I say, am I injuring anybody by saying that? And the answer is, I'm only reflecting badly on me. And that's okay, because I want people to know that sometimes the best you are is not really someone you're proud of, but it's okay, because that's who you are. But I left things out of that story. Mm -hmm. Um, I edited whole storylines out because I knew I couldn't speak the truth without injuring relationships that I would Mm -hmm. never regain. And I also knew, to be really honest in myself, that part of the reason I wanted to speak those things is because I'm still pissed off at those people. (laughs) And so, no, there's no point including that in the story, you know, unless that's the point of the story, is to say, you know, sometimes we do shit because we're still pissed off and we want to take revenge. Um, Shining light on that, too, in itself. Yes. So I think the metric to always use is... Is this a super important truth? If I tell it, will it hurt people or land that is really important to me? Will it do more good than harm? And sometimes you can't answer that question right away. Sometimes you have to write out what you have to say, and then you go back and and look at at it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's perfectly okay to say, this part of the story is not one I can attempt right now for these reasons. It's not that I'm not courageous enough. It's that the after effects will outweigh any positive effects. And maybe 
a decade from now, it might be different. You yes. might have a different way of framing it. Yes. Yeah. No story. You can't tell the whole story in any given time anyway. Some stories occupy you for your whole life. You pull out different chunks of them at different times. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Timing's important. And acting with love is a super useful guide. Can I tell the story in a way that's loving? That doesn't mean I'm avoiding the hard truths, but can I tell it in a way that's as loving as possible? And sometimes you can't, and you just have to back away and say, all right, I'm gonna wait a while, mm -hmm. see what happens. And sometimes you can say, all right, I'm gonna tell this part of the story, because that's super important, and I can tell it now with a great deal of love, and also a great deal of transparency about how conflicted I am about it. But this part over here, I'm going to have to leave that. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I think that's sometimes the kindest way to be in the world. It's true with human relationships, too. I mean, there are times when you have to set people aside and say, I cannot be the person I want to be with you. That's not a judgment on you. That's just to say, I can't right now find a way to have the relationship I would feel good about whether that's a friendship, a deeper relationship, a family relationship. There are times when you just have to say, you know, the kindest thing for me to do is set you aside and not have much, not have much connection right now. Maybe there'll come a time when I can find that connection, but right now, no. I think it's true of places too. There are places, I'm a Westerner, and there are places in the West where I could not live. I just can't. I can't go there. I don't have it in me to be the person I would want to be in relationship with that place. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just part of being me. I grapple with that too, with places I love and how there's like trauma or grief wrapped up in mm -hmm. place, landscapes I love that I long for, but I can't go to because I yeah. can't deal with it right now. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a weird place to be too. You know? It's a very weird place to be, but it's also honest. And I think honesty is part of being loving. You know, mm -hmm. honesty to yourself and honesty to others is part of being loving. I, um, I went home to Wyoming for the third time in the last 10 years. Last year, um, I moved back to Cody, which is my hometown. I wasn't born there, but I've lived there on and off my whole adult life. It's where, it's where I am most at home of anywhere in the world. I couldn't do the culture. At this point in my life, I could not live in a culture that is that hateful. I have really dear friends there who I, I love being with, but there is so much anger there. There's so much gun culture of the, it's my right to kill you if I don't agree with you kind of culture. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm summarizing and stereotyping by saying that. But one of my neighbors was someone whose husband makes a living, um, as she puts it, protecting our Second Amendment rights. He travels the country selling automatic weapons to people. <laughs> I don't believe in that. And I also find it frightening that his view of life is you should have an automatic weapon in case someone like me says something you don't like. <laughs> I don't want to live next door to someone that I have to be very careful about how I speak to when I see them on the trail in the morning in case I might say something that they took as me being bad and needing to be removed from this earth. That was really, it was a, kind of a revelation to me to realize that I once thought of myself as so tolerant that I could live next door to anybody. And now I realize I don't feel safe there. And when someone came along and knocked on my door of the house I was renovating, and asked if I would ever consider selling it, because it's one of the few in Cody that sits on a bluff right over the Shoshone River, which when I was a kid was where we threw our trash, mm -hmm. um, and now is the fly fishing paradise. Um, they knocked on my door and said, would you ever consider selling your house? I wasn't done renovating it. And I said, well, if the price was right, yeah. And by January, I had moved back here to Western Colorado, knowing that I, no longer in my life can I live in Cody because it's just not a culture that I feel safe in. That must be a conflicting grief. I mean, I think about that in my hometown. I've tried to go back so many times and farm the family land and be yeah. like, I'll restore it. 
And every time I get spit out, spit out I've pretty much given up. It, yeah. Then at the same time, I'm like, am I just abandoning this place that's like calling for someone to care? Yeah. And there's that too, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, that's a question you can't answer, I think, easily, but you can wrestle with it in writing. Yeah. And that's a wonderful one I to have a little with. bit. I mean, there's other people that are moving there who romanticize it, who don't have all the childhood right. or ancestral stuff. They're coming in and they're like, great. I'm like, maybe you're the ones that have to change I, this. I think sometimes that's what we have to recognize is this is not for me now. Yeah. And that's not to say that, you know, in 20 years it might be for you. Mm-hmm. But it's okay. In fact, it's super important to recognize when something is yours to take on yeah. and when it's not. Um, I think, you know, for me, I can drive um, out of the Grable River drainage over the divide and see Hart Mountain, which is a really super distinctive mountain right out in the Bighorn Basin, just north of Cody. I can drive over that divide and I'll be in tears every time. And Mm. that landscape just fills my heart. It always will. It always has. But I can't live in the culture that it's become, the human culture. Um, You can see the Crow Reservation from town. And the mountains, the Absurkas are named. That's the name of the mountain crows for themselves, people of those mountains in Crow. Um, And yet not a single street is named for the people whose land Mm -hmm. it is. And no one there will admit that that's the case. There's a world-class Plains Indian Museum in town, part of a world-class museum complex. Um, And yet that doesn't translate into people acknowledging that this is Crow land and that there ought to be a way to welcome those folks to this land other than once a year putting up a couple of teepees at the Plains Indian Museum and having them come dance. Yeah. That's what's comfortable to people. Yes. Who don't want to deal with the grief of what genocide. Yeah. I mean, exactly. And the ongoing trauma that they deal with as a culture, you know, the problems that they have as a culture because of that heritage of trauma. So I can't live there now. And I have had to accept that. It's been a super difficult thing for me. I mean, I, I've had to grieve a lot about that. And it's a recognition as much that I don't have personally what I need to have in order to be a positive contribution to that community. I basically cut and ran when someone offered me the opportunity to sell like, my house. Right. I was like, I'm out of here. I have to go. <laughs> and my friends get it which is really lovely. You can go visit still. I can, but the grief comes back up again, mm. you know? I can and I will because my, you know, it's, it's part of who I am, that land is. Um, but I will never have not conflicted feelings about it. And there are times when I'm okay with going and visiting and, and dealing with those conflicted feelings and there are times when I'm not. Mm-hmm. And that's okay too, that's the human condition. But it's an ongoing source of grief for me. You know, I I have in the last eleven years since my husband died of brain cancer, I have wandered the sagebrush country of, of this part of the West, the Rocky Mountain West, looking for the place I could settle. And I've tried Wyoming three times. <laughs> I've tried Cody three times, and it hasn't worked any of those times. I was there for two years while my dad was was getting old, and I thought I'd be there forever. I bought a mid-century modern house that was in need of an enormous amount of of, of rebuilding, restoration. Um, I restory houses, I say. I find houses that no one loves and I bring them back to life Um, because I hate to see good houses go to waste. Mm -hmm. Um, And I spent two years rebuilding that house from basement to roof and my dad died of a um, fast-acting cancer at 90. Mm. And I was like, I don't have any reason to be here anymore. And I left, sold that house and I left. And then I really missed it and went back again. And it didn't work. And I've had to say, okay, you know, three tries is good for you at your age. You might as well just say, no, not doing that again. Um, so, you know, and it's a, it, it, it's something I will always grieve that I don't have what it takes to be in this place that just fills my heart with joy until I have to deal with the human culture and then it doesn't. Yeah. So I totally empathize with what you're saying about your family farm and that whole, the history, what you carry. Mm-hmm. 
And a lot maybe, of people are like, why don't you go back? Other people romanticize it. Like, yeah, that seems like a great thing. I'm like, you don't get it. <laughs> like, yeah. And I've been nomadic mostly over 10 years now. Like, yeah. And part of it for the first part of it was I'm curious about, and I'm a plant geek. So I studied yeah. mainly in the Southern Appalachia. And then I just, with like te- different teachers and stuff. But then when I went West, I just been like obsessed with learning plants and ecology and stuff and have focused in certain areas more than others. And that was, that was a drive and seasonal work was a drive and yeah. just the curiosity after being yeah. growing up in a really isolated cultural place. Right. And, uh, but there's always been this, like nothing feels quite right except for where I grew up, even though when I go back there, it's not the right either. Exactly. Southwest Colorado, I definitely have felt more connected to, but it's complicated, right? You know, it's like, well, what is it worth, you know, <laughs> to stay connected if it if it keeps you from digging in deeper somewhere else and really like being able to plant your wild garden in your backyard and yeah. actually take care of it, you and know? Actually take care of it and be rooted there. Yeah. Yeah. So it requires that to caretake land. I know? totally empathize with that. and. I'm going to say this because of my experience as a writer, and it may or may not be useful to you, but you have a story to write about that land, maybe many stories to write, that may help you come to some kind of terms about the place that keeps pulling at you. Hmm. I think often in writing that kind of story that is that complex and layered, we find a new perspective Mm -hmm. and so I would say a great story to write Um, don't don't let that one go Mm -hmm. you know honor it and find a way to write it or speak it or whatever works for you Um, and then see what you think because very often writing out a story really writing it out you know not just the first rough draft but actually digging deep and dealing with the hard truths and the contradictions and all that stuff is one way to come to peace with it. Mm-hmm. And that either means you're at peace with the fact that you can never live there, and, and, and I'm, I'm saying this as if it's binary and it's not completely that binary, but, but that means you either come to peace with the fact that you can never live there or you come to peace with the fact that you can live there flawed and difficult as it is. Or there's some many middle roads where you live there part of the time or you know there's just like but I think writing the story that's so conflicting will help you find whatever path works with that place yeah it's been about five years since I've really written about it more um because other things have caught my attention yeah and I thought I had home in another place and that got yeah disrupted or whatever but it's now coming back around something I'm thinking about again I think you have to honor that you know it doesn't let you go I think that's a story you have to write I truly do I mean I think that's why it's calling you back it's not so much that necessarily maybe you will end up living there someday but I think what's calling you is a story because really you know the history of any place says so much about who we are as a species about our current culture about our current times about our history, Mm -hmm. there's so much in what you're talking about, about the complexity of where we are now and where we're going. It could be super illuminating to people. Really, truly, what memoir is, um, is just what you're talking about, about your your history with that place and your story with that place, is it's taking a chunk of our lives and reflecting on what it means for everyone. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to go live where your family history is because I'm a Westerner, but understanding the complexity of that story and your attachment and horror about some of your family's history, the culture, the land, understanding those complexities, those layers, and the grief and the love intermingled is super important to all of us in living our lives. You have a classic story of how we are both in love with and repelled by our human inheritance. I mean, it wraps up into what we were talking about earlier with like embracing the fullness of love and grief. Yes. When it comes to thinking about ecology, who belongs, what plants belong, like well, whose story is worthy, like exactly. what are we trying to do? You know, I think sometimes I think I, I get as essentially in my head about like what's the point of writing something to share? Are we, is it to be validated? Is it for my ego? You know, 
to have to put something, you know, artists make art for yeah. what reason, right? Like there's, <laughs> I, there's, I think about that, like why do I want to put this out in the you world? You want to put you know? it out, I think at our best, we as writers want to put the stories out because they will illuminate something that others need to know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, our egos would love to be validated, you know, um, all of that. But really, at our best as writers, we are telling a story that we think illuminates what others need to know. The human condition, the ecological condition, all of that. And to do that well, we have to be transparent about who we are. Um, in Bless the Birds, I said literally in the beginning, um, I had a little paragraph of disclosure. You know, I am a white female, 66 years old, who grew up middle class from a very privileged existence, frankly. And I am writing this out of that because that's who I am. I can't pretend to be anybody else, but this is what I've learned along the way. Yeah. Well, thanks so. for making the time to come talk to me at the bookstore in the back. Okay. <laughs> Paonia Books. Thank you, Emily Sinclair and Paonia Books. Yeah, shout um, out Paonia Books that just opened, but it's such a neat little It's a great bookstore. Thing here. I don't yeah. know. I'm like, I have a good feeling about it, even though I don't, I haven't been here. I've like visited this town over the years, but I haven't like been here as long as I've been here the last couple months. And I'm like, this is a cool little thing. I like it. It definitely is. Yeah. Well, thanks for wanting to have this conversation. You've stretched my... My thinking as well as my feeling in a lot of ways. Hey y'all, you just listened to a conversation with Susan Tweet, author and botanist. The music at the beginning of this episode was Old Maid's Draw by Riddy Armand. I wanted to let you know that the full show notes for every podcast episode can be found on my blog at ofsedgeandsalt.com. iTunes tends to cut off now at a certain word count, the show notes that you can find for each episode. And so a lot of the resources I tag and link in the show notes and the ways to support the podcast sometimes are easier to be found on the website. It used to be different, I think, and now they've changed it. So I've been trying to alter my show notes to to fit that. Just wanted to let y'all know that in case you wanted to do any further research and it doesn't show up there. All right, y'all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Until next time.